Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. John, welcome to the podcast. Guy, thanks very much. It's great to be here. Yeah, I really appreciate it, mate. Yeah, sure. Now, if a complete stranger stopped you on the street and asked you what you did for a living these days, what would you say? Uh, actually, I usually tell them I'm a writer because I don't really like to talk to my, talk about myself too much unless there's a purpose behind it, unless it can help inspire people or help uh, heal people. I don't really like to talk about myself too much. So I try to, I try to weasel out of that, com- that uh, question pretty quickly. So I'm like, I'm a writer. Oh, really? And they usually don't go too much further. They're like, oh, you're a writer, you know, like, and yeah. they, just, uh, they have their own opinions about what that means. And I, 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 yeah, I can appreciate it. Mean, technically, I'm a, I am a writer, but the truth is that, you know, when I was in, when I was in college, I went to the uh, University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I took courses on everything from biochemistry to, to finance to photography. And I only had one criteria, uh, and that was that I wouldn't have to write a paper. Like, that was my, because that's how much I hated writing when I was in school. So I'm not really a writer, right? <clears throat> I even had an opportunity to go to the Cannes Film Festival uh, as part of the curriculum at Penn. So it's all expense paid, you know, two or three weeks in the Cannes Film, just watching movies. And I didn't do it because I'd have to write a 10 page paper about a movie. And I couldn't think, how can you write 10 pages about a movie? Like, that's, that's where, what I grew up with. But something happened along the way, and we could talk about it, where the floodgates opened up and I couldn't stop. You know, and since then, I have written, uh, I guess, four books. And one of them has been translated into uh, four, 16 languages and is in 60 countries and is a bestseller in many, many countries. So, you know, yes, I'm a writer. No, I'm a writer. But uh, that's the answer I give people. Yeah, beautiful. And they would probably then go, what do you write about? But, yeah, um, I just need yeah. help on this. I, don't, yeah. I, I really try to weasel out of that conversation. If yeah. I feel like there's something I can contribute to that person, then I'm all in, you know? Yeah. But I don't really like to talk about myself too much. Yeah, fair, fair enough. And, yeah. And, I, and I want to touch on um, something for the listeners because they're, they're not going to be aware of this. And I'm not even sure if you're aware of this, John. But when we met in Noosa, Many years ago, I think this was going back four, four or five years ago yeah. now. And I was a dabbler when it came to meditation. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I was in and out. Yeah. And I sat, and I, and I think we had a we had a half hour conversation on the couch. And you were probably the most enthusiastic person I'd ever met at that point when it came to this. And you, and it really made me change the way I looked at it and myself. And and from there, I think you've created a monster, mate. Ah, that's awesome. <laughs> a big, beautiful monster. You know, uh, that's exactly my point is that in that conversation, which I do vaguely remember, there was an inkling in me that there was an opportunity to inspire this person into a path where they could connect with their higher energies, their higher power, their heart. And, th- and if that's the case, I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to keep going and going and going because it's just going to be channeling through me uncontrollably. But I don't talk about meditation to a stranger, for example, that I know is not receptive. I would never mention that I meditate. I've been meditating for 30 years now, all, pretty much daily for 30 years, 31 years uh, to be exact. And, uh, and I don't mention that I'm a meditator. Yeah, I have a meditation for weight loss challenge and I do these visualizations because visualizations, visualization is a more accessible term to the layman. But, but uh, what happens is those people then get inspired to become meditators. And as a result of trying to lose weight and uh, through things like visualization and mind body practices and eventually meditation, uh, there's been, I don't know how many people, probably over a million people in the world that are now meditating uh, based on, based on the, the work that we've been doing. And that to me is, that's my life's purpose. I can't think of anything I'd rather do. I wish the whole world meditated. If the whole world meditated, we would be living in paradise. There's no question about it. And it's, it's amazing because if you'd said that to me five years ago, I would have been kind of like, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But now yeah. I've been on the path and I'm on you know, the journey. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm like, well, I yeah, that, yeah. So that's, so that's, if there is an opportunity that I feel to, to open someone up to, to really accessing themselves really is what it is, mm-hmm. then yeah, I'm all in. So what, what was your, um, antagonist for meditation john like what what led you to start looking really at- interesting question you know because we find it for all the wrong re- all the different reasons right so i wanted to be able to break a brick just by touching it that was my that was my motivation for meditating so going we're going back 31 years i was 23 years old um 
my roommate had just introduced me to meditation and, and he did it through uh, this guy called Mantak Chia from, who does a, a Taoist type of practice where they circulate energy through their body. And we looked at other Taoist masters and, and I saw one was able, he put his hand on a stack of bricks and he just broke the middle one. Wow. And then I went to this guy in New York, um, Chaim Sober, his name is, uh, who is a, um, uh, practices, he teaches at a, at a, uh, a Jewish school in, in New York. And he, uh, he has the ability, to, I saw him take a big stone and touch his head to it and it just cracked. I saw this live. And I thought, I want to do that. I want to be able to break something just by touching it. So I, w I learned how to circulate my energy. And that, yeah, in order to do that, you have to meditate. You know, you meditate, you circulate your energy, open up your energy channels. I, for the record, I have never broken a brick <laughs> by touching it. And I haven't tried in 30 years. But it did lead me to that path. And, the, and all of the benefits that I did get were things that I couldn't have even possibly imagined you know, beforehand. So, that, so and I think that does happen for a lot of people. Maybe they want to meditate uh, so that they're not depressed anymore uh, or be, because they want to achieve abundance or, or have more health or vitality, but it leads you on a whole other path and, and the rewards are, are just unreal. Yeah, absolutely. And how much do you think meditation played a contribution in your own health journey? Because obviously you went on for you know, yeah. a bit of a journey there for a while. Yeah, 100%. I wouldn't have done been able to do what I did if it weren't for the the foundation that I had with meditation uh, uh, and, and the practice that I had. And I wouldn't have been able to contribute in the world the way I, uh, I have if I hadn't had that, um, you know, that background and, and to be able to basically balance, like, you know, we create these visualizations that are a balance, you know, and I'm, and I'm meditating and talking at the same time. I don't script them, right? So I have to be able to be in a meditative alpha theta state and still talk at the same time. And, uh, and I don't think I could have been able to do that if I didn't have that foundation. Yeah, got you, got you. And you've, you've opened up a loop there because some people will be listening to this going, yeah. what, what's alpha and theta? Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, we can talk about that. So uh, you, when uh, you, your brain has uh, electrical frequencies uh, that it puts out. Now, most of the time when, when we're talking, we're in what's called the beta state of consciousness where, where all the different neurons are firing real quick and fast. If you look at a, a wave of light, it's going up and down. A wave of energy has like an amplitude. Uh, it's got the, the, the energy that you're putting out in the normal state when we're, when we're talking is real small energy, uh, real small wavelengths, and real scattered. And that's the way we are right now, kind of scattered, frenetic. I'm thinking about a million things. I'm multitasking. I'm driving. I'm texting. I'm talking. You know, it's all happening, and then we're scattered. Uh, when you go into a meditative state, you go into some deeper uh, brainwave states that are called the alpha state and the theta state. Uh, theta is deeper and delta is the deepest. Uh, but in the, in the alpha and the theta state, the amplitude of the wave gets higher and slower. Uh, so you go from, your, from about uh, 30 cycles per second down to 15 cycles per second. And the other thing that happens is that all the brain waves start moving in the same direction. Uh, they start to become very synchronized. And this leads into a place where you're calm and relaxed and also more powerful because the higher the amplitude of an energy wave, uh, the more powerful it is, uh, and exponentially more powerful. So if it's 10 times bigger amplitude, it's 100 times more powerful. So you become more powerful, more focused, more relaxed. And that's why you'll, you'll notice when you're in the alpha state that your mind's not wandering. You're really focused. Other examples of being in the alpha state is if you're watching like the Olympics and there's this gymnast doing this impossible routine and it's the, and, and she's got to get a 10 to, to get the gold medal, you know, and there's all this drama going on. You are thinking about nothing else, but that you are so focused. If you're doing art and uh, you're just so focused on getting that leaf, right? You're not even looking at the leaf anymore. You're just looking at these squiggly lines, smaller and smaller, of different colors. You are so focused. If you're having a great massage, if you're making love, whatever the thing is, when you're so, you just become so, so focused. And it's usually very associated with a very pleasurable state. We want to get into that state where our minds aren't scattered. We're not running all over the place. We're very focused and relaxed. Uh, and then the theta state is even deeper. The theta state is the dream state when you're sleeping. You go into the theta state. Uh, and many people notice when I, when I do live visualizations, my eyes flutter. almost, And that's, the, that's associated with when you're sleeping, you've heard of rapid eye movement, REM. Uh, when you're dreaming, you have REM. So when, uh, when you're meditating and you're doing a visualization, you go into the REM state. And, and, uh, and that's the theta state 
in the theta state's even deeper, where you're even more focused and you're just not even associated with your body anymore. So you are not aware of your body. You're in a dream place. You're either, if you're conscious and you're visualizing, you're dreaming that you're walking on the beach and, and everything's going great in your life and the weight's melting off. You're there. That's where you are. You're not in your body anymore. And it's true when you're sleeping, you're not in your body anymore, you're some dream place. So these are the different states that are associated. The, the greatest meditation masters can get into what's called the delta state, uh, which is just four cycles per second. Most people uh, get, get into that state when they're sleeping and not dreaming. It's at that, that time when you're just knocked out. But great, great meditation masters can get into that state while they're conscious. And their brain waves are so powerful at that point that they can manifest you know, amazing things. We've heard of meditation masters doing so-called miracles, and it really is because their, their uh, focus and brainwaves have gotten so powerful that they can, they can actually manifest things that, they, that they're imagining or wanting to create. It's quite incredible, isn't it? And yeah. do you find, like, how, how powerful do you find visualization from working with other people and yourself over the years? Visualization is one of the most powerful tools that you can use in any aspect of life. If you look in all areas of life, uh, the, the, the people that have the greatest achievers in all areas of life, they may or may not talk about it, but some of them do that they use visualization. Uh, Michael Jordan talks about the fact that he used to visualize you know, the ball going in over and over again. Tiger Woods, uh, before he hits the ball, every single time, he visualizes where he wants that ball to go. Uh, uh, Car Carl Lewis, I don't, many, I don't know if you know who he is, but he was a sprinter in the 80s, uh, 70s or 80s. He won nine gold medals. Uh, he said every time right before the gun went off, he would visualize him, his chest breaking the, the, the thread, the tape, which they don't do anymore. They don't have that tape anymore, but he would visualize that every single time. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, said that when he he was the most accomplished bodybuilder back in the 70s of all time when he the, his first biggest accomplishment was the Mr. Universe he said he visualized being on the stage holding up the trophy so many times that he said in his mind it was impossible for him not to have won that and then he went on to do it for all his Mr. Olympia he every event that uh, Mr. Olympia that he competed in he won uh, then he went on to visualize being a successful actor uh, and that was, and then he and he did the same with politics. He visualized himself winning the the event with, with politics. Oprah Winfrey visualizes, uh, talked about visualizing. Billie Jean King, the tennis player. Jim Carrey, taught, is, has an amazing story. So he's got this story where he said he said that he used to, when he was a starving actor, he would uh, sit at the top of Mulholland ba uh, Drive and visualize all this success. And then he said. He once wrote a check for himself for $10 million and he dated it three years in the future. And it said for, for, for acting services rendered. And uh, three years to the day, it's an incredible story. He got a check for $10 million for the movie Dumb and Dumber. Three years to the day. Uh, so he's a big proponent of visualization. People that do it. I remember when I was working on Wall Street years ago, I was, a, you know, I was in Wall Street. Uh, um, I had a client who was a self-made billionaire. This was a guy who uh, he fought as a fighter pilot in World War II. He was an old man, fought as a fighter pilot in World War II. Uh, then he ended up in Japan penniless afterwards, after the war. He started working, in a clo working with clothing and clothing manufacturer. He set up a, somehow set up a small clothing manufacturer. Then that grew. And then he sold that clothing manufacturer to the Limited, which is a big clothing company, or was. I don't know if it's still around in the, in the States. It was like the Gap at the time. Uh, for ten percent of their stock, and uh, and then became a billionaire, and then went on to do many other things, and so he was a multi-billionaire, self-made. And he said, and I never asked him, "Do you visualize?" He just said, "I visualize my success." He said, "I see things going in all different directions. I see the business flourishing. I see this happening." And uh, and so I've seen it in all walks of life. And, and in my opinion, nowhere is it more powerful than with with weight loss, which is what we do it with, uh, because. You are, you are using it as a tool to communicate with your body. And, uh, and our bodies are very confused about modern day life. There, there's lots of stresses that we're programmed to react to in ways that are not suitable uh, for, for to, in today's world. We get, and our body gets very confused hormonally. And you actually use it as a tool, a visual imagery tool to communicate with your body. And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. If you, were, if you flew into China 
uh, and you had to go to the bathroom. How do you know where the bathroom is, right? Assuming you don't really read Chinese, right? You don't read Chinese, right? So, so how, how do you know where the bathroom is when you go and get the airport in China? You, you just start walking around and looking. And looking for what? What are you looking for? The toilet. A sign. A sign. But what's the sign? What does the sign say? The sign would have to have a symbol on it. The sign would have to have a symbol. That's exactly my point. Symbols are the way you communicate with someone that doesn't speak your language. <sighs> and our brain, the survival part of our brain, does not know English. You can't, the, the intellectual part of our brain, the cerebral part of our brain, and the survival part of our brain do not know how to communicate. And when you use symbols, like when you visualize the weight melting off of your body, and you, with intention, do, do it to communicate to your subconscious that this is the way you need to be to survive and be healthy in this world. It's like you're, it's like you're drawing a picture of a man with a toilet or something to someone that doesn't speak the, the language. Visualization is a way to communicate with our bodies. And, and that's the biggest problem that we have from a health perspective that we don't even realize we have. We do not know how to communicate with our bodies. I love you want to be thin. The first thing, like if you, if you say, I'm never going to eat chocolate cake again. You know, you can try that right now. Like, let's say, I'm never going to have chocolate cake. What's the first thing that happens for you if you do that? You what think you about say? chocolate cake. Think about chocolate cake, exactly. And you start salivating for chocolate cake because you made a visual image of chocolate cake. Do you understand? So totally. if you make a visual image of chocolate cake, your brain, your survival brain is going, mm, yummy, let's have chocolate cake. So it doesn't work. You have to speak the language of your survival brain. You have to speak it in symbols. Now, if you were to, if you, let's say you never wanted to eat chocolate cake again, just as an example. How could you communicate through that to your body? Well, here's what you could do. You could visualize yourself eating chocolate cake, and as you taste it, you realize that it's not really chocolate, it's mud, it's dirt. It's something even more disgusting. And you spit it out and you wanna throw up. If you visualize this happening, and the most amazing part about visualization is our survival brain doesn't know the difference between a real and imagined experience. Like if you're sleeping at night and you dream that you're being chased by a tiger, you wake up and you're sweating, your heart's pounding, your, brain, your body doesn't know that it's not a real experience. So a visualization to your body happens as if it's really happening. So if you were to really eat a piece of chocolate cake and find out that it's actually something disgusting, mud or dirt or something even worse, you would never eat chocolate again. I know I've seen people have this. So you can, so you can use that. That's how you can use it as a tool to communicate with your survival brain. And, and, and when you make a visual image of how you'd like to look fit and healthy, you're communicating to your survival brain, this is the, this is the template. Go to shift to that set point, not to the one you are, because yeah. this is what we need to be to, to be set. Oh, yeah. And your survival brain will understand. So it's ah. so incredibly powerful. When I was over 400 pounds, um, I had, every night as I was going to sleep, I had a visual image that I was healthy, fit. I had no loose, you know, I lost all the weight. I had stomach muscles, no loose skin, and, I had, and, and two years later, I looked exactly the way I visualized myself being, and, and I also don't think that's a coincidence. Amazing, and, and something that occurred to me there was when you were on that weight loss journey, yeah. and you're, like you said, you, you know, you're 400, 400 pounds, and you've got this, this distance, right? Now, most people go, that is way too out of my like there's this cognitive distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, how do you, or how did you yeah. cultivate the faith and the belief I'll behind I'll tell you, it's actually, I have an answer that's very paradoxic. And that is that I gave up trying to lose weight completely. <laughs> I, I remember being over 400 pounds. Let me just turn up my phone here. No worries. I remember being over 400 pounds uh, and thinking about, you see, you have to understand the backstory. So, I was, I was fit and healthy when I moved to New York in 1990. I was like 183 pounds. I was an athlete. I uh, started working hard. I had a real high stress job. I stopped working out. I started gaining weight. And I didn't worry about it too much because everybody does that, right? Everybody stops, they, you know, they stop working out. They, they're sitting around all day. They gain 10 or 20 pounds, right? But the thing is, I kept gaining. So the first year I gained 10 or 20 pounds. Second year I gained 10 or 20 pounds. By the third year I was like 225. And I'm like, okay, I really got to start doing something about it. So I did what everybody does, which is go on a diet, right? Cut out this, cut out that. So I do that. And what I find is that what I found was that I, I lost maybe five pounds over a three-week period through brute force, but I was fighting cravings night and day. And then I have this big binge and then the weight would come back. And then I went through this 11-year period where I'd lose five pounds, gain 10 pounds, lose five pounds, gain 10 pounds. 
until I was over 400 pounds. And when I say I tried everything, I worked face to face with Dr. Atkins from the Atkins diet. I worked, mm -hmm. I worked fit. He's dead now, right? So he's not, he's not around anymore. But in the nineties, he was around, he was in New York, just like me. And I spent thousands of dollars with him. Uh, I'd show up at his office every Monday morning, seven o'clock. Uh, and he'd do tests and blood sugar and metabolic syndrome, and all this kind of stuff. And in the end, he just yelled at me. I wasn't losing weight. And he yelled at me. He goes, what are you doing? You're killing yourself. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm showing up at your office at seven o'clock in the morning. That's what I'm doing. I, I'm going to the best of the best. That's what I'm doing. I'm spending thousands of dollars and it's not working. And so, and everybody has this idea with weight that uh, when people gain weight, it's because they're not compliant. They're weak, they're lazy, they're overindulgent, but that is not the reality. If you really understand the biochemistry of it, what happens is uh, certain uh, stresses in your life cause hormonal changes in your body that cause your body to hold on to weight. And those need to be addressed. So anyway, but, but I wasn't addressing them and that's what most people don't address. So I was gaining, gaining, gaining. So when I was over 400 pounds, I thought this kind of thought came into my head. said, you know, for whatever reason, your body just wants to be fat right now. And there's nothing you can do to stop it as long as it wants to be fat. And I knew that was true. And I had a moment. It was like a cathartic moment. I just sat there and didn't have another thought for like 20 minutes. And then I decided I was never going to diet again. <laughs> and if I ha and I decided that I accept if I have to live the rest of my life at 400 pounds, I'm going to do it. Okay, I'm not going to try to lose weight anymore. I'm not going to go through this roller coaster yo-yo thing. I don't want to gain any more weight, but if I don't, if I'm not going to lose it, that's fine. This is me, 400 pounds. I accept it. I surrender. I had this moment where I really surrendered, and that was like the turning point for me. Amazing. Like right after that, something happened. My mom had been trying to get me to. to uh, get a sleep study test because I have very bad sleep apnea. And I, and I didn't know at the time, but I know now that sleep apnea is a stress that can cause your body to hold on to weight. So I finally listened to her. She'd been nagging me. She said, get a sleep study test. I finally got the sleep study test. Turns out I had life-threatening sleep apnea, which can be corrected with something called a, a CPAP machine. Started using that. All of a sudden, I'm sleeping deeper. I'm not as hungry. I'm losing weight. I had another really cathartic experience two weeks later, and that was that I was scheduled to fly from uh, Newark to San Francisco uh, um, on United, uh, on, on, this was uh, September 11th, 2001. So this is 9-11, right? So uh, I was, I, if I had booked the flight, it would have been the United Airlines Flight 93. That was one of the, the planes that got downed uh, in that flight. I was going to be on that flight, but my business partner booked the flight. So I was away and I said, just book, the, book some flights. Uh, he found a cheaper flight, it was $300 cheaper, went from, through LaGuardia Airline, Air, Airport, which is a, a, an hour away from where I live, hour and a half with traffic, stopped in Cincinnati, it wasn't a direct flight, and, and it just saved $300. Now, I was going to, uh, in that uh, trip, I would have spent $300 more in parking, plus I had to stop in Cincinnati, you know, and it was the only time in my life, this guy's sort of like my guardian angel, he introduced me to meditation, by the way, this guy, oh. was it was the only time in my life that I've ever been mad at him. And I've known him now for 30 plus years. And, and it turned out he saved my life because if I had booked the flight, I would have been on that New York, uh, uh, that United Airlines Flight 93. And that was the, a really powerful experience for me because I realized that here I was killing myself. Okay, I was, I was working in a job I didn't like. I was good at it. Uh, I wasn't great at it, but I was, really, I was good at it. There's no question. Um, I was making a living, but I did not like my life. I did not like living in New York. I never saw the sun. I wanted to be in nature. I didn't like sitting around in my head all day talking about bonds and all this stuff. stuff. I hated my life. Uh, but I, didn't, I wasn't doing anything about it. It was always like someday. And, and a couple of years prior, I had bought a house in Denmark, Western Australia, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. It was always my dream that someday I would go there. But I wanted to save up enough money so I'd never have to work again kind of thing, which I hadn't done anywhere close to. But you know, I had a little bit of money. Um, but when that happened, I, I realized that, uh, here I was killing myself, but the universe just gave me a second chance. So at that moment, I decided I was going to start living my life. Now there was no more some days for me. I was on borrowed time, you know, that I was not going to pass mm -hmm. up the gift and the opportunity that life just gave me. It was really clear to me. Life spared me. And I'm like, look, if life spared me, I'm not going to waste my life which I'm doing right now. I know I am. And so I closed my business. My wife was pregnant. I didn't know what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I moved to Western Australia. 
I started growing my own food, not entirely, but, you know, we had fruit trees and we had strawberries and we had uh, just, you know, we had, had, had a little bit of food going in the backyard. Uh, it was a beautiful property overlooking the water, tw 12 acres with carry trees. And, uh, and, I, and I just decided to go there without knowing what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And then when I got there, um, I was really worried because I, w I couldn't make a living with my, with my body anymore. I, couldn't, I could barely tie my shoes. And, and I was too stressed out to work with my head. So I didn't know what I was going to do. And I called my brother and I said, Joe, you know, what, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And he said, just pray, ask for guidance. He's real religious. And, uh, and, and even though I meditate, I don't really pray per se. That was not my thing. But I did. I spent seven hours just saying, please guide me, please guide me, please guide me. And then something happened and I just knew I was going to be okay. I, I felt like I had a connection. I made a connection to guidance. I didn't, you know, like the universe didn't say, okay, this is what's going to happen the rest of your life. But, but I, I knew I had some communication. I had developed some communication with the non-physical parts of me, with spirit guides or my higher self or whatever's non-physical out there that knows what's going on. I developed a connection. And after that, it was just my life. The weight started melting off of my body. I wasn't trying. I wasn't weighing myself. Uh, I only weighed myself once in the whole period of time that I lost that 220 pounds. And that's because I was at a doctor's office and I had to, had to get weighed. The weight, and I was still eating pizza and candy and chips and ice cream and all this stuff that you're not supposed to eat. I was doing everything wrong and the weight was melting off of me. Eventually, I started eating healthier and healthier and exercising and, seeing how, and running with the momentum because it was like I was riding this huge wave and I wanted to see how far I could go with it. So I was inspired at that point. But that was only after a year of losing weight that I even said, oh my God, I've lost over a hundred pounds. I'm sure I could maybe lose all this weight. And then I got the energy. Got it. But I had given up entirely on losing weight. And that's why I say it's a very paradoxic experience. And, uh, and what I tell people many times is, is uh, surrender is very powerful. Surrender to where you are right now. Be in the moment right now. And, uh, and let that be the, the catalyst for change. Don't look for change. Don't be unsettled. The whole time I was gaining weight, I was like, I can't believe you're 250 pounds. You're so fat. You need to lose weight. And then all of a sudden, I'd be 275. And I'm like, I can't believe you're 275. You're so fat. And, then I'd be, and I just want to get back down to 250. And then I'd be 300 pounds. And then I just want to get, you know, so I was never satisfied. So I'm just like, be here, surrender right here to where you are. And that act of surrender somehow changes your your the fight goes away and you're and you start working with the universe instead of fighting it chris carr you know from crazy sexy cancer remember i interviewed her once and she said i had to surrender to the cancer of my body I said okay you and i have to coexist i accept that you're here i'm not going to fight you you're here i surrender and she said that was a turning point and i really believe that in the same way that there's uh, uh, like five steps to grieving, you know, you ever hear that? That there's five steps to grieving, you know, there's denial and anger and, yeah. and blame and, and then acceptance. I believe that there are specific steps to transformation. And the number one step is surrender, completely I, surrender to where you are right here, right now, and ask for guidance. I think that is the first, I'm even getting goosebumps. Bump, bump. So am I. Yeah, so that, that is the first step to surrender. Go to transformation. John, I love it. Like, and, and, you know, I can even relate that into my own life with 1A Nutrition because I'm, right. start, I'm starting to resist. Like it, one day I wanted to be teaching and working with what I'm doing now. Yeah. And then I had in my hand that I'll always do it next year or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And then the pressure cooker just kept building and building yeah. and building. And then it's yeah. like, I am going to have to make a choice. And yeah. when I let go, when I surrendered, yeah my world opened up yeah. and it, and it, and it's continuing too. And it's, yeah. And it's really hard to explain until you go through it. You have to go through it. But when I, you know, being 400 pounds, leaving my work, uh, having a pregnant wife, not knowing what I was going to do for the rest of my life and moving to the other part of the world where I didn't know anybody was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was the, the rewards are, it just keeps going. And I even every day, every single day now, guys, not a day that goes by since then that uh, after I finish my meditation, I say to the universe, I say, uh, please guide me. Please speak through me, act through me, feel through me, uh, think through me. I surrender to you with all my heart and soul. And then I say, please radiate your love and your light into this body and out into the world according to your will and your agenda. 
I surrender to you with all my heart and all my soul. And that's what I do every single day. And, I, and, the, and if I don't, that's how I have to start my day because I know that if I don't do that, I'm in my head. You know, it's me. Yeah. It's like, oh, no, we were to do it. But when you do that, and you form this connection. So every day I'm deepening this connection to that experience that you're having right now where you're riding this wave of it's not logical. It doesn't make sense, right? You had great business. You were thriving. Why would you walk away from something that's not logical? But this part of you, this non-physical part of you, this feeling part of you had to do that. And when you honor that part of you, because that part of you knows your life's path. It knows the future for you. It knows what's coming around the corner. The, you know, the logical part doesn't. And there's nothing more powerful than your intuition and your feeling. And when you can strengthen that connection to it, you live a completely different life. You, yeah. you feel supported. You feel loved. You feel the life, your life has purpose and meaning. And it just opens up for you. The, and that's what you're experiencing right now. Yeah. I, I always say um, faith is a muscle and you just exercise yes. it daily. Yes. I look at it. Uh, that's exactly right. And, and the way I conceptualize it is slightly different, but true, true the, same, the same end result is that there's a channel, a tube between me, this physical being, this physical, logical survival being, and something else that is all powerful, all knowing, all loving, knows the future. Because as we know from quantum physics, time doesn't exist. This is our brain. Our brain is telling us. The, yeah. But there's a part of us that's non, the non-physical part knows what's coming around the corner. So there's a tube that connects me to that. And what I do is every day I clean that tube, I open that tube, I widen that tube, I run more and more energy back and forth between that tube every single day for years and years and years. So that, that because I was a very logical part, I'm not one of these people that you know, you know, grew up with intuition. My dad said, you know, when you, when you die, you cease to exist and that's it. And, and, that's, and he, was a, he was a scientist, he was a dentist, he grew up in the, you know, in the 50s when, it, when science was king. You know, let's, let's just make a chemical and blast the food. It's a great idea. You know, we're smarter than nature. Let's, let's, they used to spray kids with DDT. A lot of kids that had polio, they didn't have polio. They were poisoned by DDT. They would spray them with fire hoses because they're so smart. You know, this will kill all any bacteria. We need to kill all the bacteria. We're so smart. We're so much smarter than nature. And, and, and so we all grew up with that. You know, doctors are smarter than nature. We'll get a pill. We'll get a surgery. We'll cut it out. It's just cut out your appendix. Cut out your, your thyroid. Cut it out. We'll give you a pill. You know, yeah. so we grew up in this logical, and I grew up with this logical thing. So, so there was this, this years and years of unlearning and habitual thinking uh, to, to strengthen this connection of intuition. And now I don't always know what's going to happen. And sometimes I am worried, you know, when I, I can't figure out what's going to happen. But I keep going into that connection. I keep asking for guidance. I keep surrendering to it. I keep strengthening that tube that connects me. And then all of a sudden, like, it's just miracles. Some amazing, amazing things happen. I've seen it so many times in my life it's that that's, that's the predominant place that I go when I'm trying to figure out the universe. I, I get it. And, and for anyone listening to this that thinks that's a stretch right now, I'm actually getting um, uh, ex-NASA physicist Tom Campbell on the show in a couple of weeks. I studied quantum physics and consciousness yeah. for 40 years. Cool. And, and so I'm going to get the science behind that, everything that you've been talking about there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So well, yeah, the, the, it's, it's a fact that, that time doesn't exist. That's a, that's a convention of the mind. It's a mathematical fact. Totally. Uh, yeah, there's lots of other things that, you know, the, uh, our mind and our five senses make up a very false version of the universe. And that's another place where meditation comes in, in handy, if I could just uh, say it. So, so let, let's look at this. So, so uh, we have five senses. We have, the way we make up the world and understand this world is five senses and our, and our mind, right? Now, uh, one sense is, is touch, right? So I'm touching my fingers and they're solid. I have a solid finger, uh, a solid thumb, solid finger. I'm touch, they're pressing against each other now. But if you look inside the atoms of my finger and thumb, what you see is you, inside the atom, there's a nucleus and electrons. Now, it, there, it, the, 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 there's as much relative space between the nucleus and the electrons of, of those atoms as there is the, dis the, the distance between the sun and the planets in the solar system. So if you look at our solar system, it's 99.99999% empty space. And that's also true of atoms. They are 99.99% empty space. Now, if you go further and look inside the nucleus, which is where all the mass is, uh, and you look at the particles, what you see is that those particles can sometimes exist as a physical particle and sometimes as a wave of energy. Yeah. At any time, they can be a physical or a wave of energy. 
And that wave of energy, and this is quantum physics talking, this isn't me making up woo stuff, that wave of energy can exist inside your finger or anywhere else in the universe within an instant. It can be on the other side of the universe at an instant. Which means that even though I see this as physical, my thumb and my finger touching as physical, what's really going on is I am 99.99% empty space, and the mass that I have is just waves of energy all over the universe, and that's not an exaggeration. So we see ourselves as physical, our eyes and our brain make up physical, but we are really just waves of energy all over the universe. That's what we are, and that's quantum physics talking. That's not some uh, mumbo jumbo theory. So we make up this world that doesn't exist because in our world, you're over there, I'm over here. Uh, I'm a physical, everything's physical and time's going in a sequential way. But the reality is both you and I exist all over the universe as waves of energy. We are not solid and, and we are also existing in all time. We are, you, you and I right now and all, everyone else exists in, in, in all time right now. And that's the reality. Now, you can't access that from your five senses. Your five senses is going to tell you this bullshit re- version of reality that keeps, yeah. you, that keeps you focused on being an army ant and, and churning out whatever you got to churn out in the world through fear and false reality. But there is another part of you that knows the reality. It's a non-physical part of you. The non-physical part of you knows that your waves of energy all over the universe, knows that time doesn't exist, can see what's coming right down the road for you. And you can access that part of you through meditation. It's like a sixth sense. People talk about the sixth sense. And there are people that are very psychic or very intuitive. And there's nothing mumbo jumbo or strange about that. They have developed their sixth sense or their psychic sense. And you can develop that like a muscle too. And I'll tell you exactly how. And I just know this from experience. No one ever told me this. But you know when you're, you, you look at a kid and they have a lazy eye? You know, you know what a lazy eye is? Where one eye is yeah. going like a five-year-old kid, they have a lazy eye. So, so what do you do when a, when a five-year-old kid has a lazy eye? What do you, what do, you do for that kid? Do you, do you know? I have no idea. You put a patch on the good eye. For, I, I, had, I remember I was babysitting as a kid, a five-year-old, beautiful kid, beautiful blue eyes. He had one lazy eye looking at you like kind of sideways like this. For a week, he had a patch on his good eye. And the reason that they did that is because the lazy eye, the muscles of the lazy eye were weaker than the strong eye. And if they didn't do that, the strong eye would just keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And the lazy eye would get lazier and lazier and atrophy. So they, for a week, he had a patch on his good eye and it forced the lazy eye muscles to get stronger and stronger. Well, what I believe we all have is a lazy sixth, a lazy third eye or a lazy sixth sense. We never use it. It doesn't get, it doesn't get validated in this culture and it atrophies. And when you meditate, it's like putting a patch on your five senses. You are awake and alive and you are not paying, and it forces you become, what you do is you start to feel, you start to sense, you start to get impressions, feelings. I, we have a friend staying here today. I got this feeling. I was meditating. I got this feeling. I said, I have to ex- express this to her. Out of nowhere. I don't even know her. She's my wife's friend. I said, look, I, you know, I got this hit. I don't know if you're interested. Let me tell you. She started crying and crying and cathartic experience. I don't know what it meant to her, you know, but it was a feeling. It was a hit. It's because the muscle's gotten stronger. Every day, if you practice, your muscle of of sensing gets stronger. And that muscle, nothing is more powerful and more beneficial for you than being intuitive, than having that intuition and having that guidance. Because let's take, like, let's say you're a businessman, for example, brilliant stock investor, right? Made billions and billions. No matter how, no matter how smart you are, if you're working through your logic, you know, the market could crash tomorrow. Yeah. And you can't protect yourself from that. No matter how smart, you didn't know that, that a plane was going to crash or, or a nuclear power plant was going to blow up. You can't predict those things when that's going to happen, but your intuition can. And, and, and your intuition is a million times better for you than your logic. I have a, a coach. Uh, I just got to tell you the story. If I'm rambling, I'm sorry, but I had this coach, one of our Gabriel Method coaches, her name's Melinda. So she went to a movie, it was 2012 in Aurora, Colorado. It was the midnight screening of Batman Returns. She was so excited. She was with her friend. Uh, They were waiting. You know, nobody else has seen the movie yet. It's an exciting event, right? She walks into the theater. She says to her friend, we got to get out of here. Her friend says, are you crazy? We just got here. I'm not giving up this seat. She she grabbed her friend by the arm and she said, we are getting out of here right now. 20 minutes later, a gunman opened up and shot 70 people. That was the Aurora, Colorado shooting. 
Wow. How did she know that? How did she know to get out of that movie theater at that time? How do you, how, how can you explain that? That's not chance. That's not luck. She's not, a, she's not a superstitious person. She's not a nervous person. She doesn't do things like that. How did she know? That's a sense that she has developed, that we all can develop and live our life that way. I had an experience uh, a, a while back where I was biking and uh, I used to bike up this hit, this dirt road and was through wineries when I was living in Denmark, Western Australia. And there was this one hill, it was really short, about 200 meters, but it was straight up. And whenever I got to the top of that hill, I, I'd always hold my hands up, you know, like a bike racer and go down like it's like a victory thing that, that was. So I got to the top of the hill, I was about to do it. And this feeling said, no, don't do that. Hold on to the handles. A millisecond later, a six foot kangaroo came out of nowhere and charged me. It was just trying to get across the street and it was scared. I scared it. Now, if I did not have my hands on, the, on that, that bike, I would have crashed into that thing. And they have huge talons. They're not violent creatures, you know, but they've got that huge talon on their back and they disembowel dogs all the time. I would have been dead. There's no way I would have survived that or I would have been really in bad shape. How did I know that? What was that voice? It was the only time, hundreds of rides over years, that uh, that voice ever came in. Why? How? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's a sense we all have. And that's why I say I want the world to meditate because we have to evolve. We have to develop this sense because this sense also makes you feel more connected to people. You're less selfish. You don't, you don't need to have everything to feel safe because you have this guidance, you know, so you can be nicer. You can, you don't have to destroy the world out of greed or fear. You know, you don't have to compromise because you have a connection and that connection feels good. So you feel good. You feel supported. You feel loved and you feel connected to others. So you don't want them to suffer. And that's what will transform the world, is each of us individually transforming and developing those, that higher sense. Yeah, that, totally. And that's why meditation for me is, is the most important. I love it. it. It actually just made me think of um, a documentary called PGS. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Mm. But, um, so it, I, it's coming to DVD next month. I'm getting the, the, the guy who made it on in a few weeks, yeah. actually. But he had a similar, sorry, he's a movie maker. And yeah. he heard a, a physical voice saying, stop. And he just slammed on the brake and a, yeah. and a truck would have taken him out, even though the lights were green. Unreal, right? And then he went and made a movie to find out why. Unreal. He, he you know, if we were living in a world, Guy, you and I, where everybody in the world was not using their eyes. They had eyes, but they didn't use them. They never used them, right? And let's say you and I were the only people that, that had eyes. People would think we were a freak. How do they know I'm over there? How do they know how tall I am? How do they know it's a girl 50 yards away? They're, they're psychic. It's the, it's the devil. It's the demon. You know, like they would have all this religious stuff around it. Some people would worship us. Some people would call us the Antichrist. You know, like they would all develop their mumbo jumbo around it. But the reality is we've got a sense that no one else has. Yeah. And we do. We have a non-physical sense that no one is using. And I want to live in a world, I want this world before I die to be a world where everyone is using that sense, yeah. where we're acknowledging it. The, the, uh, the US Navy uh, spends millions of dollars a year studying intuition because they have found that uh, there have been too many unexplained coincidences where people got out of being blown up at a restaurant, you know, like a sergeant of a uh, of a platoon would tell everybody, let's get out of here right now, and then the restaurant blows up. You know, it's, it's happened, things like that have happened so many times, you can't ascribe it to co coincidence. So they are now researching, spending millions of dollars a year researching intuition. It is a sense we all have. We are, in a sense, living in the dark ages uh, because we are, we are the one sense that could really protect us and connect us and help, have us feel loved and give us meaning and purpose is dark, it's closed. So in that sense, we are living in the dark ages and we need to, as humans and individuals, transform, mutate ourselves to the point where that sense is open and we are functioning in that way. And then life takes on a completely, completely different meaning. It does. We don't feel lost. We don't feel lonely. We don't feel insecure, worried, and then chronically ill with all, and having to take all kinds of medications and antidepressants that make us worse and worse. We don't need any of that anymore. We yeah. have it all. We have bliss, love, connection, guidance. We have it all. All, all within us already. All, all within us already, yeah. And you do have bliss. That's the other thing I didn't, you know, you read, you read books like The Autobiography of a Yogi, yeah. you know, Yogananda, and they talk about bliss. And well, what is bliss? I mean, like, it doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, but I have to say that I have these, I never look for it, I never seek it, but I have experiences where the only way I can describe it, there's no other word, is bliss. And, uh, 
and you cannot compare it to any physical experience. You cannot compare it to, you know, skiing down your favorite slope or surfing your best wave or having, or having the best sex of your life. You can't compare it. It's not even linear. You can't say it's 10 times better. Uh, it's just not even linear. It's, it's a different experience. And when you have that experience, that's all you want. You just want to seek that more and more. And it's all inside you. And there was a, a, a meditation teacher that once said, uh, told a story about a guy. He was a beggar. He used to sit on this uh, wooden box for 30 years uh, begging for scraps. Every day he'd get a crumb from somebody. Beg, please, please, can I have a crumb? Um, and then one day somebody said, hey, what's in the box? And the guy said, I don't know. I've never looked. And he opened up the box, and the box was full of diamonds. Wow. But he never looked there. And it was such a great analogy for how we live our life. We are begging from, for scraps from the outside world, validation, money, whatever. Please, Mr. Boss, Mr. Wife, uh, complete strangers on Facebook, please like me. Please give me. I have needs. They're not being satisfied. When inside, everything. Everything you could ever want and more is there. So there's a mutation that happens where you get away from the need to have five sense validation and the need to have mental validation, and you go further and further into having the non-physical bliss and connection. And that's an, that. That's when your life takes on a whole whole another path. That's such a cool analogy. And yeah. I just I just want to add to that for anyone listening to this, you you've just got to start doing the work. You've got to go on your own path, and you've got to start yeah. training that lazy eye. And it's, it's it has to be daily. You know, that's the yeah. thing. Even if it's thirty seconds. Uh, it has to be daily. I find there's a, there's a very diff, distant difference between people that say, oh, I love meditation, but you know, maybe they meditate uh, once and then they forget for two weeks and they've been doing that for 30 years, as opposed to someone who's a daily meditator. Someone who's a daily meditator, their energy is completely different. They're calm, they're relaxed, they're centered. They're not trying to you know, convince you of anything. They're just really in that place. Mm -hmm. and they, You can instantly tell that uh, because they've gotten it. They're, they're, they don't have to force themselves to meditate. I don't have to force myself to meditate. There's nothing I'd rather do. Nothing. Sometimes, I'm, uh, sometimes it's two in the morning and I'm meditating and I'm grateful that I have, can, like, that there's nothing else I have to do right now. You know, there's nothing I'd rather do. So I don't have any bucket list. I don't need to be anywhere in the world. There's no physical experience I ever need to have ever again. I don't care if I live or die. I don't need to exist. If I'm here and I'm serving a purpose, that's great. And, you know, I'm a father. And so I, that's very meaningful to me. But nothing else. I don't need to be here. I, I feel more connected to the non-physical part of myself. That if I was, I know that if I was gone, I'd just be there. That's the, where I go every day. I spend hours there every day. So I'm happy to be there full time. You know, when that happens. So I don't have the, I don't have the the biggest fear that we all have is the fear of death. I, don't, I, I, I have, there's nothing in me that, that has yeah. that. Amazing, yeah. day by day, moment by moment. It was yeah. Beautiful job. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to change gears. I've got a couple yeah, of yeah. questions yeah. Um, that I want to ask you. Yeah. And the first one is, we've kind of um, touched on this already, but I ask everyone on the show, um, what, what's been one struggle in life that's later become a blessing? Yeah. Well, for me, it's real obvious, right? So yeah. I, I gained 220 pounds. There was nothing I could do to lose it. I, was, you know, I went to every diet and every expert. And that did become an, a blessing because when I finally surrendered and, and used it as a tool to go deeper, uh, asking for meaning and purpose and guidance, it melted off. It was the basis of the message that I send out to the world and it's become my life's purpose. So that's a, that's a real easy one for me. Yeah, to yeah for sure. Do, yeah. do you look at that almost like any problems as teachers now that come? Yeah. Any problems in our lives or things that we can't come as almost yeah, like teachers? Yeah. Many, many times I, I feel yeah. that the things that we are struggling and resisting and hating the most, uh, it's so hard to see it in the moment, but it ends up being a blessing in disguise. Yeah. There's yeah. No question. Maybe not always, but I see it really, really often with people that I work with. Yeah, fair enough. Man, I, I could probably guess the next question, but what does your morning routine look like? Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, you, got, you can guess that one real easy, right? So uh, I wake up and I meditate, and uh, I have a very specific meditation that's based on, you know, uh, different teachings that I've learned, that, uh, but it's all based on, using my mind and visualization to move light through my body uh, mm -hmm. as a way of opening up my energy channels. You know, the, uh, um, Eastern medicine talks about your uh, energy channels, your acupuncture meridians, your life force channels, whatever you want to call it. In, uh, in India, they call them nadis, but we have these life force channels that's like a circulatory system. And you can use, you, you can use light, you can move light energy, invisible light energy through them, and it acts like Drano. It opens up the channels. So... I go through this process where I open up the channels and, and I know when the channels are open so you just feel energy can run from the top of my head down into the uh, uh, ground 
or through my chest. There's no amount of energy that I can't handle at that point. Like a nuclear explosion of energy would just go through me. There's no, no, no resistance. So when I know that that's happened, I know I can handle a big transmission of energy. That's when I ask for uh, the non-physical aspect of myself, my higher self, whatever you want to call it, to work through me. Uh, I say, please, please I surrender to you. Please work through me. Please speak through me, act through me, think through me, feel through me. And then I say, please radiate your love and your light into this body and out into the world according to your will and your agenda. I surrender to you with all my heart and soul. And I actually feel like this explosion of light. It's the only way, like, it's almost like I, oh, my, my molecules cease to exist. And I, this explosion of light wow. goes through me and out into the world. And I imagine it then going into the world and this white light going all over the world and then transforming other people, inspiring other people. Inspiring literally means in spirit, spirit coming in. So I imagine it inspiring other people to meditate, wake up, live their purpose, and, and that the world becomes bliss. And then, and then when that happens, then after that, it's, it's not my job anymore. Whatever happens in my life, I'm happy. You know, just, uh, I've surrendered. I've surrendered everything, my voice, my mind, my thoughts, surrendered it. And then I just I live my life. And I find when I do that, which is pretty much always, um, everything, you know, things flow beautifully. If I, if I ever don't do it, I, like at the end of the day, I look back and I, I almost wish I hadn't got out of bed. I was reactive. I was in my head. I said something I wish I hadn't. I did something I wish I didn't, didn't, you know? So that's, that's, that's what I do. And then the rest just happens. Whatever, whatever happens after that, I don't have a plan for it because I've been surrendered. You know, yeah. Beautiful. I love it. Um, last question. If you could have dinner with anyone tonight, from um, any time frame in the world, okay. yeah. who would it be and why? Yeah. Well, my favorite kind of like, uh, heart emotional connection is a uh, uh, a, medit uh, a meditation teacher that lived uh, in India in the 1800s. His uh, the name that they gave him was Ramakrishna. You know, it's not his real name, but his name is Ramakrishna. Uh, and many people know the Ramakrishna Institute. And then he trained Vivekananda, who brought meditation to the st to the states in the in the early uh, 1900s and introduced meditation to the Western world. Really, uh, that was his, uh, Vivekananda was his student. Um, he, like, I feel this incredible connection to that person. So yeah, I would, I'd want to meet him. I want to, I don't need to have dinner with him or not, but yeah, to be yeah. around him would be, would be, I would choose that for sure. Kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And, um, is there anything with everything we've covered today yeah. you'd like to leave our listeners to ponder on? Well, I think the theme is just, and it's a power is to follow your heart, you know, and even, you know, what's interesting, Harvard, I've read this thing, a Harvard study of unhappiness. They developed, they determined the seven things that make people happy. Number one was meditating. <laughs> and then there were a bunch of others, I remember. And then the last one was follow your heart. Yeah. Live with life, meaning, and purpose. Develop that connection. We all have purpose. We all have a non-physical side of us that knows why we're here. And it's up to us. This is a partnership. That, you know, that, that non-physical side is not, is not going like, to uh, show up and shake you it's going to respect who you are and your will and your, and your agenda. So you, it's a partnership. You have to do your part. And your part is to ask. Ask for guidance. Open up. Surrender. Ask for that power to work through you, to inspire you. That's your part. And then when you do that, then as your feeling and intuition gets stronger and stronger, live within your heart. Live within your, that intuitive guidance that you're, uh, that you're creating and deepen that connection. And that is... When you do that, you are always on purpose. By definition, your purpose is to be a conduit for the higher energies that are you that, that want to come through this well. Love it, John. Love it. And for everyone listening to this, uh, if they want to find out more about your work, yeah. uh, where can I send them to, John? Yeah, just go to our website, thegabrielmethod.com. There's lots of free information there and lots of ways to contact us. So yeah. thegabrielmethod.com. Beautiful. John, thank you so much for coming yeah, on. Pleasure, just yeah. Awesome. Rolling with it. That was absolutely mind blowing. And awesome. uh, no doubt everyone's going to get a great deal out of it. Thanks, John. My pleasure. Take care. Cheers.